So, uh, good evening, everyone. The, uh, the topic is uh, that of pets in halacha, um, which has become, a, I mean, keeping pets has become something that's, uh, I think, increasingly popular over the, uh, over the last few years and something that uh, more shiders are being asked about and uh, there's more interest in. So, uh, before I start, I want to say a few thank yous. And the first thank you is to the people within the community who have uh, been asking shiders about this and uh, caused me to learn and focus on a, on a part of halacha which I haven't really, uh, haven't really done much of. Um, I also want to express thanks to uh, several people, including, I didn't know, Ben, that you were going to be here, but including Ben Samuels, who is a from vet and uh, who has helped me on uh, several occasions, more than several occasions, with various uh, uh, technical uh, matters, and indeed halachic matters. He's uh, referred me to various halachic sources, so uh, thank you, Ben, for that. Um, I myself uh, have been on... Uh, um, have been a pet owner both in my childhood when we had uh, rabbits and ducks and uh, with, my own, uh, with my own children, gerbils and other such things. And um, uh, pets are, are something that are, can be very positive in, a, in, a, in anyone's life. Um, in terms of children, there's, there's a chinuch element to it, there's an uh, educational value to it. It teaches children often responsibility, um, care, kindness, um, uh, sort of exercise. Um, the studies that show that life expectancy is increased amongst those that own pets, um, that they're fun, and they're a, they're a clean and positive form of entertainment in a time in which uh, there are many other easily accessible forms of entertainment which aren't always as positive. So it's definitely something uh, important. It also teaches us something about the natural world. We learn about the natural world. And uh, Chazal already talked about learning about Midas. There's a, uh, a Gomorrah in Erevin which uh, says, Umoli nitno Torah, if the Torah wouldn't have been given, we would have learnt Tznius Mechatl, we would have learnt modesty and Tznius from a, a cat, Gezel Minimola, theft from an, an ant, an ant is careful not to, uh, um, not to steal, but it, uh, it prepares food uh, itself, Arroyus Miyono, we would have learnt uh, appropriate behaviour in uh, relationships from a, a pigeon, a dove that is uh, loyal to its mate its whole life, etc., etc. So the Gemara, exactly what this Gemara means is, is perhaps not so simple. The Gemara is teaching us that there are things that we can learn from the behavior of animals and uh, the natural world that can teach us how we ought to behave. And il uh, in the Torah, it says, were the Torah not to have been given, we could have learned these things from animals, which is a remarkable thing. So there's things that we learn from the Torah that we could have learned from animals and from an awareness of animals. And therefore, certainly, if we... Um, uh, if we don't have contact with the natural world and in our uh, society, our, our, uh, our culture, which is often quite cut off, cut off from nature, we miss out on, on that part of insight into the natural world and, and certainly uh, um, having animals is something that can deal with that. It's funny, when someone saw, saw the title of this year, um, they referenced uh, me to a newspaper article which spoke about an animal being awarded a medal for bravery. And they have a little bit of a snigger about this ridiculous idea of an animal getting a reward for bravery. There is um, an army award that's the equivalent of the Victoria Cross for animals. There's the equivalent of an OBE or MBE for animals. And um, I also joined in a little bit there, snigger. Until um, I came across a, uh, a Yerushalmi, which uh, tells a remarkable story about a dog that, um, and, and these stories are known, a dog that became aware that certain food was poisoned. And the owner was about to help himself to the food, and the dog began barking hysterically and uh, was unsuccessful in, in communicating to the owner that uh, it didn't want the owner to eat this food. And eventually the dog jumped forward and ate the food itself in order to save the, uh, the owner and died. And uh, in one version, the Yashalmi, the Psikta carries on the Yashalmi, and says they put up a matseva, a monument, in honor of this, uh, of this dog. Um, and they called it Nashta the Kalba, they called it the, the dog memorial. So the idea of celebrating uh, animal bravery is something that you find, even that you find in Ghazal, very interesting, uh, very interesting thing. So uh, sometimes the, uh, the assumptions you make about these things aren't, uh, aren't always accurate. I'm not going to use this forum to get into very in, uh, interesting and philosophical discussions about uh, whether animals might possibly have free will and uh, what exactly the decision-making process that this dog went through was, but it's just uh, it's interesting to be aware of that, uh, of that source. Um, having said all that, uh, it's very clear that Chazal had a mixed view about uh, us humans relating to animals, and um, th th there are two signs, sides to every coin. <coughs> Um, in, in Chazal, we don't find an enormous amount of references to the concept of a pet. Uh, they knew of animals as uh, domesticated creatures or wild creatures, which were either antagonistic to humans or were resources for humans to uh, use and exploit. Um, Chazal didn't have a, a, always a super positive view of dogs. 
um, dogs were wild animals. Um, dogs didn't hack that dogs didn't start in Kali Yisrael as they were leaving Egypt. That was something to be remarked upon. Um, they used as a metaphor sometimes for our enemies in, in Moe's Tzor. We talk about the Le'ez uh, Be'ach, Mitzor Hamnabe'ach, from the the barking enemy. So uh, the dog is used as a metaphor for uh, this antagonistic uh, enemy that we don't get on with. So uh, dogs certainly aren't always uh, um, spoken of positively. The Mekobolim speak about not having, the Kabbalists speak about uh, not having an, uh, an overly uh, interactive engagement with non-kosher animals, which have a, in Kabbalistic thinking some form of tumor and impurity associated with them. And therefore, uh, to look in the face of a, uh, of a non-kosher animal is something they're negative about. Um, the non-Kabbalistic world, the non-Hasidish world uh, to which we belong, t- doesn't worry about these things. But a- again, I'm just saying there are, there are mixed um, ideas about this. Um, there's a, uh, um, a piece from uh, a chuva from Rabbi Yaakov Emden, the great Rabbi Yaakov Emden, in which he, he talks about, uh, he says, unless you're owning a dog for functional purposes, for um, economic reasons or for protection, it's not appropriate to own a dog. He says you're glorying in, uh, um, he refers to particular dogs, uh, I don't know what he talks, he says these are dogs that don't have hair, and uh, they're bought at great expense in order to uh, play with them and, and enjoy them. And he says this is an unnecessary luxury, this is an inappropriate luxury. So there are voices, uh, I don't think this is a mainstream voice, but you don't really find this brought in most of the voice game. Uh, I don't think it's a voice that uh, um, it, it, you find reference generally in discussions about these things. One should be aware that, that uh, a great figure said that. And, and clearly there's, there's truth to that. Um, having an animal just as a fashion accessory um, or for exhibition or uh, spending excessive sums of money on an animal, one does have to think at some point, is this a good use of money? Uh, a lifetime care for a dog can be 10 or 20,000 pounds. And therefore, again, proportionality is needed here. So uh, Rabbi Akhavimdin is certainly a reminder to us that uh, mm-hmm. we need to balance it with other important uh, needs in life. Um, having said that, even the idea of an exhibition animal is referenced in Chazal, Though maybe uh, it's, it's difficult to know whether it's referenced in a positive or negative light. There's a pasuk in Melachim um, in which it talks about uh, uh, um, uh, the, the king of Tarshish, Chiram, coming and bringing to Shloma various gifts, Zav, a kesef, gold and silver, and amongst them, Kofim, the uh, peacocks and monkeys. So uh, what are these peacocks and monkeys for? Presumably for entertainment or exhibition. Part of the glory of a king is being able to show off their, um, their zoological gardens and, their, and their, um, their animals and so on. So again, you do find uh, <coughs> such an idea. Um, moving on in the, in the light of this sort of hashkafic thought about the rights and wrongs of owning animals, that we do drift into halachic uh, territory. And there are several Gemaras, uh, Gemara and Baba Kama, uh, a mission in Baba Kama, Gemara in Baba Kama, Tasvav, and a mission in, in Baba Kama that speaks about um, owning a dog. And the mission is quite uh, negative about owning a dog. But the reason the mission says not to own a dog is because of loisosim domim bevesecha. One isn't allowed to have something dangerous in one's house. So in the same way as uh, if one has a flat roof which is used for things, one has to build a partition or a fence around it. Um, similarly, if you have a dog, at least a dog which is unchained, as referenced in another Gemara, um, such a thing is a dangerous thing, so says the, uh, so says the Mishnah and the Gemara. Now, the uh, Mepharshim and uh, the Poiskim already discuss which sort of dog are we talking about. Um, and the majority view is we're talking about a dog uh, which bites. And therefore, the Mishnah is simply saying that it's a dangerous thing to own. If you own a dog, you have to be careful. It's not always a great thing to own. It can do damage. And an owner is responsible, in many cases, for the damage that uh, the animal does. And uh, the Lysosim Domine Sechel, this is something that can do significant damage and can also even cause uh, death. Uh, Rashi speaks about, and, and other places talk about the fact that the dog is Menabeach, it barks. And uh, an extreme barking can cause fear and fright to people. Um, it talks about a scenario where, where such the, the, the fear that the dog causes causes a, 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 causes a miscarriage. And therefore the consequences of the fear that people feel towards dogs can also be uh, significant. Um, the the remark says that the minhag is, t- uh, well, it's clear, a dog that bites and barks, everyone would agree, uh, it, one, one needs to be very careful about owning it and has to be confident that one is able to look after it the whole time and ensure that it's always uh, secured such that it won't do damage and hurt people. That, that's, that's obvious. What about a dog that just bites? So the remark brings that the minhag was to own such dog, sorry, a, a dog that just barks. 
The Ramal brings that the, the Minhag was to own such dogs, but the Ramal seems to imply that's because uh, he said we live in dangerous times. We live amongst hostile <coughs> populations, and therefore we need such dogs for, uh, pre for protection. Um, and there are various senior poskim, the, uh, the Shulchan Aruch Harav, the, uh, the Shulchan Aruch of the uh, Baal Hatanid, the first Babavich Rebbe, which is a very senior halachic source, the Yamashal Shloma, um, uh, from the generation of the Ramah, generation before the Ramah, again, a very se senior halakhic source, that says that a dog that has a very uh, frightening bark would be included in this prohibition. So again, one has to think when one owns a, uh, buys a dog, um, certainly, uh, is there a risk that this could cause damage, cause damage whether through, um, uh, um, whether through it, its bark or um, its bite, whether its bark is worse than its bite or not. Um, one has to think again about this. Um, in, in practical halachic terms, if a dog does cause damage, or any animal causes damage, um, each case would need to be looked at within the, the laws of, um, uh, of, of responsibility for damages, but, but most likely one would be responsible for it, so, uh, or there's a good chance one would be responsible for damage that a dog does, or, or a cat if it scratches uh, things and so on. So uh, this is something, uh, I'm not going to go into details about this, but this is a halachic matter that one needs to be cognizant of when one talks about uh, pet ownership. <coughs> yes, sir? Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, indeed, in that context, it, it's not a positive source, right? It, um, it talks about the uh, the money spent on or money gained from selling a dog shouldn't be used to buy a sacrifice in Beis Hamikdash. Again, it seems to indicate there's something negative about uh, about uh, dog ownership. Um, ha just to conclude this area. Uh, we will come back to these sources, but there are Gemaras that do reference uh, animals being owned as pets. And it's very clear that, uh, maybe not owned as pets in, in the modern sense in which one had a fixed animal that one owned long term and uh, uh, connected with, even that there are sources for. Um, but the Gemara, in the context of carrying on Shabbos, speaks about um, a chagov, uh, a locust. And it says, This is a Gemara in Shabbos study on the base. Um, a locust used by a child to play with. So children used to play with locusts. Um, and that, that's a, a source about this. Um, the Gemara talks about uh, birds which were kept by children as pets and discusses about, uh, um, about the halachas of that. And there's even a, um, a, very, fam a very important source in, in, in Shmuel Base. There's the famous uh, story in which after David had his sinful relationship with Bathsheba, um, Nothan Hanovi, uh, came to give him Musa a rebuke and told him the famous parable, the moshul of uh, um, a poor man and so on. And in this moshul, he talks about uh, the poor man owning a, a ser, a lamb. And uh, he used very strong language to describe the relationship of this person with the lamb. The lamb grew up with, uh, um, with this poor man together. And then he carries on. The lamb became like a daughter, like a member of the family, which is how we would describe in modern terms, perhaps, uh, uh, a pet, that the pet almost becomes like a member of the family. It's very interesting that um, Nosan Hanovi, in his uh, parable to David, in which he's saying to David, you're, you're, there's a poor man and you've taken their, their possession, their, their property away from them, and this is how you've treated uh, Bathsheba's husband, etc., whatever the story there is, um, refers that the, mon the moshal that's given is a ser, a lamb that's, that's a pet, in, in very similar to modern day terms, that's become almost a member of the, uh, of the family. So uh, again, I, I just to start with this point that uh, in, in Chazal there are, are different strands and uh, <coughs> ways of looking at uh, animal care and the idea of having, uh, investing emotionally in an animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think both halves are important to know that. On the one hand, there's significant positivity in it. On the other hand, there needs to be a, pro a sense of proportion about both the emotional and financial investment that one makes uh, in that area. So that's uh, a little bit of, a, of an introduction. Um, Going through now some, some of the halachas, there's, there's a vast array of halachas that we can really talk about, and uh, I'll try and get through as many as I can. Um, one halacha, that, an early halacha that hits one, is um, that of making sure one feeds one's pet or animal in one's care before uh, eating oneself. This is derived, this is a Gemara in Brachus, and the Gemara derives it from a Pasuk in Shema that we say, in which Hashem describes himself as feeding animals ahead of humans. Say this in the second paragraph of Shema. I, uh, I Hashem, will give uh, uh, grass and, and uh, green herbs to grow in your field. Who's this for? So that the, the food is given to your animals and to you, are you to you humans, to eat and be satiated. 
So what's Hashem saying over here? He's, he's, Hashem is speaking and saying, if you do well, if you, if you do everything correctly, I'll ensure there's plentiful food supply for your animals and for you. Who puts animals ahead of humans? What sort of uh, scale of values is that? And from this, the Gemara and Brachas derives that uh, animals, uh, the reason Hashem says this is because an animal is meant to be fed ahead of a, uh, a human, from which we derive a halacha that one should feed animals ahead of human beings. Now, the context of the Gemara and Brachas is a remarkable uh, Gemara. You see how seriously the Gemara takes it. The Gemara says that if someone washed and made hamot silachim in Haaretz, and they're about to put the, few, the piece of, of uh, bread in their mouth, that they shouldn't speak. They should put the piece of bread in their mouth. Nonetheless, if they remember then that they haven't fed their animals, they are allowed to say to their, their assistant, Gavil the Torah, go and give food to my ox, and then I can eat. In other words, this is not a hefzak in the Bracha, because it's a necessary prerequisite in order to eat the food. Uh, an interruption between saying a bracha and eating food is, is if you go off on a tangent, something irrelevant. But if this is facilitating and enabling the eating, then that's, that's not an interruption. It's actually not ideal to have to do this, but if one finds oneself in that situation, and that's the only way to sort it out, one is allowed to say, gavil the Torah, one is allowed to um, ask for uh, the, the animal to be fed. So, so this is remarkable, you, you, uh, a very significant uh, halacha over here. Now, um, the Rambam is of the view that this is not a true halacha, this is just appropriate practice, midas chasidut, it's not a strict halacha. Um, it, oh, that's on one extreme. On the opposite extreme, we have a Morgan Avram, who, who thinks it's a deraisa, because it's learned from a pasuk. Consensus is it's a drabonon, but it's a chiyav nonetheless. Uh, it's learned from a pasuk as, as an illusion, a hint, rather than a strict halacha. The pasuk doesn't say, thou shalt feed your animals ahead of humans. It says Hashem speaks in language which indicates that this is an appropriate uh, way to behave, <coughs> and therefore this certainly remains the, uh, the halacha, that one should feed an animal ahead of uh, a human eating. Now, um, th there's a few things that should be said on this. The first thing is, this is obviously if the animal needs to eat. Um, there's no mitzvah if uh, one eats uh, three meals a day to ensure that every time one's feeding the animal, if it's enough to give uh, the animal one meal a day, um, or it's not yet the eating time of the animal. But in a situation where it is the eating time of the animal, this is the right thing to do. To, uh, to when the pet, when it's time for the animal to eat, to ensure that one feeds the uh, animal first. This is uh, halacha number one. Um, there are various exceptions to this halacha. The, the, the place can point out um, actually a very interesting source. Um, do, do, we, do we know of a source in the Torah where um, we find a righteous person um, feeding a, a human ahead of an animal, giving something to a human ahead of the animal? Rivka, when Rivka, when Eliezer comes to the well and he meets Rivka, um, so what does Rivka say? She, she is a balas chesed. She offers Eliezer and the camels drink. And she offers who first? She says to Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, um, the Prophet says, uh, I'll also give your animals to drink. So she first watered Eliezer and then watered his animals. So uh, the post can learn from that that drink is different to uh, solid. You can drink first ahead of animals. And there are several reasons given for this. First, because drink is only a minimal delay as opposed to a significant delay when it comes to eating, and therefore we're less worried that the animals, you know, the, the person will engage in their own eating and forget to care for the animals. That's perhaps one reason. A second reason may be because um, drink can cause suffering. If you're thirsty, you need to drink. And this has just arrived from the desert, and maybe he's thirsty. Um, and therefore it will cause uh, suffering, and, and so on and so forth. So there are various reasons given for this, but um, certainly if it comes to drinking ahead of an animal, one can do so. Um, secondly, all said and done, this is, uh, according to the majority opinion, merely a, not merely, but it, it is only a mitzvah drabonon, and therefore if a person is weak or starving, they can feed themselves ahead of the animal, one doesn't have to suffer. If one's suffering, one can eat first. Um, what about children ahead of animals? If you're, uh, you need to feed your children or grandchildren and... Uh, the yeah, animals also need feeding. Well, who, who comes first there? The place can say there, again, certainly a child that's young and doesn't have uh, particular self-control. One of the reasons why an animal gets fed ahead of a human is because an animal doesn't understand the delay. Part of being a human is that we, 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 we can see the future. And we know that uh, I'll feed the animals and five minutes later I'll be able to eat. Whereas the animal, if it's kept waiting, is, it's helpless. It doesn't really understand. So at least with helpless children, uh, feeding children would come ahead of the <coughs> animals. Um, and also about guests ahead of animals. Also an interesting question. If you, uh, if you have the mitzvah of Achnosor and guests have turned up at your house and you suddenly remember you haven't fed your pets, um, again, then probably guests will come first because that's, uh, that's human care at the end of the day would come ahead of uh, animal care. So uh, these are just some points to be cognizant of. But again, there's an important value in this, which is uh, the Torah's telling us that, that if we have animals in our care, we have responsibility to them and we should uh, ensure that uh, all else being equal, 
we feed them first if that's what they need. Yes? If guests come first, so maybe that's why Rivka asked her here the first to eat. Th that is a good question. I, I don't really understand the proof from Rivka because there, there may be several, they, they, they're even thirsty arriving in the desert. Um, they're not her animals, and therefore she has no particular obligation to feed the animals. So she's doing an act of chesed, and therefore she can choose. Okay. And thirdly, maybe I'll consult him. You are correct. Who knows if they need it? But th that, that's, uh, that's what the person means. You're right. I don't, I, don't really, uh, um, <coughs> I don't really understand it. It's interesting, though. It could be the deer from the continuation of the Pasuk. Because the Pasuk carries on, and then it says that when they arrived at Lovon's house, Vayitin Teven Omispo Kamalim, he gave uh, hay and straw to the camels, and then he fed Eliezer. So when it came to feeding, he did put uh, the animals ahead of the humans. So maybe there, there the point is the contrast in the Pesukim, that when it came to watering, they gave the animals first, when it came to feeding, they gave the humans first. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on from that topic and uh, move on to a few other matters. Sorry, they yes. need to say the other way around. Yeah, sorry. They water to the humans and then... Water to the humans first and fed the animals yeah. first, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, the next thing I put in my title is, uh, was uh, Kashrus. Um, a, a, uh, um, a young member of the community actually came up to me, absolutely horrified, and said, um, but no one would eat their pet. Um, and thought I was talking about whether you could eat the uh, pet. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Kashrus as applied to uh, feeding uh, one's animals. Um, one does have to make sure to, uh, to feed animals properly. My, I, I grew up... Um, next door to uh, our neighbours, our immediate neighbours, um, were vegetarians, and they had a dog, which they also kept on a vegetarian diet. Um, <laughs> yes, poor dog. Um, and this dog was, uh, was absolutely irrational as a result. In fact, he once took a bite out of my brother um, in desperation for meat. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what we assume anyway. I, mean, I, I didn't ask the dog why I took this bite, but uh, um, this, this poor dog was, was raised vegetarian, and it was quite weak as a result. Um, I, I owned a, uh, a rabbit, <coughs> and uh, one uh, holiday we went away and we gave the rabbit in care to one of these city farms. You know, you have these city farms scattered around. And I don't know what happened to the rabbit while we were away, but it came back and it was absolutely wild and traumatized. And um, sadly, it never really calmed down. And it grew bigger and bigger till it was the size of a cat and, and a ferocious creature. And um, I was the only one that was able to handle it. And I was away once for weekends, and my father had to, uh, we used to let it out into the garden in the day, and then he had to put it back in the cage at night. He spent hours trying to get it back in the cage and couldn't, and in the end left it out overnight. <coughs> so uh, that night, my parents uh, heard noises in the back of the garden, and they woke up, and they looked out, and they see torches in the back of the neighbor's garden. Anyway, they went to sleep. The next uh, morning, the, the neighbor contacted them and told them that they'd called the police in the middle of the night because a large and ferocious black creature was unidentified had started on the dog. And they'd called the police, and the police had been out there trying to identify this large and ferocious black creature. And it turned out the rabbit had had a fight with the dog. The dog had been desperate for meat. And uh, the rabbit had a fight with this uh, dog, and the, dog had, the rabbit had won because it was this vicious <laughs> creature. And the dog was weakened by its vegetarian diet and uh, ended up with claws across its face. So um, uh, I, I tell you this is an anecdote simply to say that uh, one does have to feed one's... Uh, don't, 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 uh, don't keep the ve your animal... On. Well, if it's a rabbit, you can keep on a vegetarian uh, diet. So if it's a dog, uh, don't. But what, what halachas do apply to feeding uh, animals? So uh, in principle, an animal uh, <coughs> doesn't have the laws of kashrus. An animal can uh, eat non-kosher food. The uh, only concern of foods where there is an isahana, a prohibition to benefit from the food that applies. Now, most, uh, most what we call non-kosher food is forbidden in achila. We're not allowed to eat it, but we're allowed to benefit from it. And therefore, one can use it to feed one's animal. Um, the main two exceptions to this are milk, milk and meat, which is not just forbidden in achila, but also forbidden in hana and benefit, and chomit and pesach. So just taking them one by one. Um, Basel Cholov really uh, consists of two levels. There's the Deraisa level and the Drabono level. The Deraisa level is forbidden in benefit. The Drabono level is only forbidden in Achila, in eating, but one is allowed to benefit from it. So uh, one needs now to be a little bit of a halachist and uh, check the ingredients on one's dog food or, or pet food, dog food in particular. Um, if the ingredients only show meat, there's no problem there whatsoever. If they show milk and meat, um, then you have a potential issue over here. Uh, the sort of ingredients that you might see which are milky are, are, are casein and whey, these sorts of things which are, are milky. And if it's showing milk and meat, you then need to dig a little deeper. It's possible it has milk and meat and it's not a problem. So, for example, if it just has milk and meat in, but they're not cooked together, 
then uh, you're simply eating milk and meat together. There's no pr prohibition of benefiting. It's just milk and meat. We Jews can't eat that, but it's not forbidden to benefit from, and therefore there's not a problem. However, if they are cooked together, then there's a potential problem. And then there's additional things one needs to work out. For example, milk and meat of a non-kosher animal is not a problem. That it's only forbidden because it's the non-kosher food, meat, or non-kosher milk, but not because it's milk and meat. In other words, milk and meat, which is has the enhanced status of being forbidden to benefit from is kosher milk with kosher meat. If it's non-kosher milk or non-kosher meat with the other one, then it's, it remains plain old boring non-kosher, but it's not milk and meat, it's not basa v'cholov, and therefore it wouldn't be, again, forbidden in hanar. <coughs> so in each case, we want to have to work out what the, what the scenario is. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details because it, it's, it's technical, other than to say um, it's worth a check of your pet food, and if it shows only meat, only milk, no problem. If it shows both in the ingredients, then uh, we, should speak, uh, we should speak further. Uh, one doesn't have to worry about unstated ingredients like we do with human foods, because again, there we rely on bittle and various other things. So anything that's below 2% are not showing on the ingredients, even though obviously for humans that's potentially a problem, and that's why we can't just check the ingredient labels to work out something that's kosher or not, but nonetheless for animals that, that isn't uh, an issue. Just to clarify what yeah. you said, if it's cooked uh, and the ingredients are non, if it's non kosher milk or meat, yes. it's not a problem. That's correct. Yes, it, it, but if it's non-cooked or it's, uh, um, it, that's right, so if, if it's not cooked, even if it's kosher type of meat or kosher type of milk, then again, it, and kosher type of milk, then it, uh, it wouldn't be a, a problem. Um, very briefly, just going through uh, chomets, again, um, well before Pesach, if one has a pet, one should check whether there's chomet ingredients in the pet food. Um, if the food is merely kitneous, it's not a problem, we're talking about real chomets over here. Uh, wheat grain and things like that. We're not talking about seeds and corn and nuts and uh, any other things. But if it's real chomets, that, that can be potentially a problem. Um, before Pesach, research it. It may be there's a perfectly viable non chomet alternative, which one can then get the pets used to. And the KLBD website, uh, the OU website, um, has various ideas. Uh, ben Samuels, who I mentioned earlier, helped me before Pesach on several occasions and worked out, helped me work out a non Chomet's equivalent. Um, so speak to a from vet or, or check on the websites. Normally it can be worked out. If it can't be worked out, then one needs to go down routes which are more complicated, in which involve selling the chomets and selling the animal. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of that. There's actually not ideal routes to follow, uh, but they're possible. There, there are always solutions, but it's just worth waking up to the problem a month or so before Passover, rather than the last minute, so that one can uh, resolve the, uh, the issue. Um, so that deals with some of the kashras matters. Um, let's move to Shabbos, which has a whole range of uh, things to talk about on Shabbos. Um, and the first issue I'll deal with, which is really a very, very common shayla, is that of mukta. Um, a child owns a pet, whether a pet uh, lizard or a rabbit or a cat or a dog, um, and they want to play with the pet on Shabbos. That's what, what could be more normal. Um, and they want to stroke the pet and pet the pet and uh, lift the pet and hold the pet and do all sorts of things with it. Now, the Gemara in, um, in Shabbos um, says that one can move an animal if it's in pain, um, but otherwise not. In other words, it takes as an assumption that one can't move an animal for no reason on Shabbos. Um, and uh, this is understood based upon this Gemara and other Gemaras and the him that there's an, uh, an issue of mukta with an animal. Now, why is there an issue of uh, mukta with an animal? Because the animal isn't useful in the mukta sense. Mukta, on Shabbos, anything which has no use for Shabbos is mukta. Um, certainly if it has no use because of a particular prohibition, for example, a pen is mukta on Shabbos because you can't use it to write with on Shabbos. Um, but even if it has no use on Shabbos, just because it's a useless object, again, it's mukta. So stones lying around on the floor are mukta on Shabbos because they have no uh, use. They're not, they're not set aside before Shabbos for a particular use. So the Gemara assumes that an animal is mukta. Why? Because an animal has no particular use on Shabbos. You can't plow with your ox. Um, you can't uh, shecht your animal. Um, what, what purpose does it have on Shabbos? You can't ride a horse on Shabbos because of uh, uh, um, uh, the prohibition of riding the horse. There's, there's, you can't get your pack animal to carry things on Shabbos for you. We'll see later because you're not allowed to get your animals to do work for you on Shabbos. So what use does the animal have? And therefore it is classic uh, mukta. So this is what the, uh, the Gemara says. <coughs> now, the Rishonim discuss several scenarios where the animal does have a use, um, and, and the examples they look at are, are, are use or pet-like uses. So Tosis talks about a little uh, chick, 
And Tosa says, brings a view of Rabbi Yosef, one of the Rabbi Yosef, who says that uh, this wouldn't be mukta because it has a use on child, as a child could play with it. Um, then there is a Or Zerua who brings a, uh, uh, a viewpoint that songbirds, these are songbirds. Songbirds, again, wouldn't be mucks on Shabbos because you enjoy having the birds sing you songs. Um, and it is clear that the <coughs> consensus of opinion, the majority of Roshonim, do not accept these allowances. The Rosh, in particular, is cited by all later Poskim, and Rosh says, I don't agree with these distinctions. It's very interesting why the Rosh says he doesn't agree with these distinctions. The Rosh says, I don't accept this. An animal is muktzah, it's muktzah, it's muktzah, that's it. Don't begin telling me a chick because you could play with it, or a songbird because you could sing with it, and so on. He says several different reasons for this. One reason, he says, is lopaluk. Lopaluk is a, a halachic principle. Laws are framed, and we don't begin looking at every scenario. It's a, a, no, we don't draw overly draw distinctions. Uh, the halach was puskins that an animal is mukta because generally animals are mukta. You've got a rare scenario where someone has a songbird or a, a child wants to play with a chick. That's a, a rare exception. We're not going to do uh, the halacha doesn't a legal system. All legal systems follow the general normal use, and this is something that's a, a rare exception. That's the first point the rosh makes. Second point the Rosh makes is that this chick wasn't set aside as a pet. It's, it's on Shabbos. You had this chick and you thought, maybe I could use it for a child. He also says, a songbird, you're not really using the bird for anything. It's, it's, you're not using it. The bird sings and I enjoy having it sing. It's, it's, a, it's a background uh, vehicle of entertainment. But I'm, I'm not using it. Using means something that I do something with. I'm not doing anything with, with the animal. I'm not interacting in any real way with the animal. I'm, I'm passively enjoy being in the presence of the songbird because I enjoy it singing. And therefore, this isn't enough to make it uh, non-mukta. Um, he says that, that uh, in addition, he says the fact that I'm going to dream up a particular use. He says, are we going to say that no stones are mukta because I could give a particularly pretty stone to a child to play with? He says this isn't enough to take it out of the category of mukta. And, and the Shulchan Aruch Paskins that way, the Shulchan Aruch says animals are mukta, and doesn't make distinctions between uh, animals. Now, modern-day poiskim have begun questioning this. And the reason they question this is because the, the Gemara scenarios are not identical to what we would call a, a pet nowadays. Um, the, the Gemara says a songbird, uh, sorry, the, the Rishonim examples, it talks about a songbird. A songbird, you're not, as I said, you're not physically engaging with and using for anything. You're not interacting with it in any way. You're just enjoying the song. And um, the Efroyach is more like a modern pet. The chick is like a modern pet. The child wants to play with it. But there you have the second argument. It's just a chick. Most chicks don't become animal, to, uh, animal uh, become uh, pets for toys for little children. Most chicks either get eaten or move, go on to become adult chickens and, and lay eggs. They're not set aside. That, that, there you have the Rosh's claim, which is, are you going to say that every pretty stone is, is a potential toy and never ceases to be mukta. Yeah. That, that's, that's different to uh, uh, a modern day pet where the pets are specifically set aside to play with. And playing with things is a very, a very real use. Every toy is played with. That's what, why is a toy not mukta on Shabbos? Because I play with it. That's, that's a, a type of use of objects that we have that clearly is a non-mukta um, category. On the other hand, the Rosh also says that we don't draw distinctions. And an animal is mukta, he says, and we don't begin distinguishing between different sorts of animals. So th this remains a little bit in, in flux in, uh, in halacha. Um, and, and different posts can take a different view. Uh, Rabbi Vadi Yosef, and, uh, um, in, in, in his, uh, in his Yabi Omen, uh, in one of his halachic works, um, assumes that an animal, doesn't assume he proves it at great length, as is his way, uh, that an animal, even a pet, is still mukta. Um, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein is cited, the Rosh of Gush is cited as holding that an animal is mukta, um, and various other, other prominent authorities. Rabbi Shimon Zalman, there's various different si uh, views about what he said. Um, in, in the recently published volume 8 of Ramosha Feinstein's Teshuvas, the Icarus Moshe, <coughs> Ramosha Feinstein absolutely explicitly says that this halacha of mukta is a songbird. He says when it comes to a pet, it is not mukta. So we have a very, very uh, prominent and senior poisek who does not believe that uh, an animal is, uh, that petting an animal is, is a problem and does not believe, sorry, I should say, a petting animal is, is, is not, would not be mukta. And that certainly is a, uh, a significant halachic view, that a petting animal is not mukta. Ramosha would agree that a non-petting animal would be mukta, and that there's no discussion about. A bird or a fish in a tank, in which we don't interact with, other than just enjoying the, the, the beauty, that's not a use, and therefore everyone would agree that's mukta. However, um, animals which we enjoy petting and do interact with, there, there are significant grounds to argue that they are not mukta, um, and that uh, that would appear to be the view of uh, Ramosha Feinstein and possibly of Shemazal and Oba. 
Yes, yeah, he doesn't, he thinks this is significant enough use. The Lopalug never, the Lopalug was, was a normal creature, but here we've, we've, we've created in the modern world a whole class of, uh, you know, a, a whole class of use of animals, which is a genuine use, and therefore uh, um, he considers that not, not, to be, uh, not to be an issue. Uh, and then as they were talking about Mukta, which is an Issa Drabanon, and there's a significant uh, senior poisek uh, of the Ilkha Vemesh Ranchi, the other view, um, I think this is a, uh, it's, it's a prominent view to be aware of. Um, and, and therefore, uh, certainly, um, th th it's, it's, as I say, it's a significant view to, to rely on. For animals that one pets, uh, animals that one doesn't pet and interact with, like, like fish and birds, that, that wouldn't be the case. Um, what, what, sorry, yeah? What about the shedding of hair? Okay, so, so there, are, um, there are still a few things that, that need to be said about this. Um, Touching certainly would be allowed. No one, you, no, Mukta um, doesn't really mean not to touch something. It means not to use or move something. We're normally cautious about touching because it can cause it to move. But a gentle touch isn't a problem. The truth is, even stroking a, a pet, um, I, I think everyone, almost everyone would agree it's okay. There's really a line in the Shulchan Aruch that talks about touching the tail of an animal. There you're not touching the body of the animal, you're just touching its hair. And there isn't really, uh, uh, there seems very strong grounds to say that it wouldn't in any way be included in the prohibition of... Uh, mukta. Um, similarly, if the animal is in pain and you need to take the animal to the vet, um, the, the, I'll, I'll come on in a few moments to the halacha of uh, health care for an animal, and then I'll talk about shedding hair also when you're combing an animal. But certainly if the animal is in pain, uh, um, that would again be, be an allowance. But one does need to be cognizant of the mukta, as I say, for animals which uh, aren't petted or, or just wild animals. If you're out in the countryside and you're going for a walk on the Shabbos and you see a... Uh, and a horse or a cow, and you want to touch it, then then that would be a problem. Mukta, sorry, or move it at least. Yeah. I think you just answered it, but the fish jumps out of a fish tank. Yes. Can you pop it back in on shadows? Um, <laughs> that's that's a very interesting question. In terms of mukta, you would have uh, the suffering of the fish there. There are other problems with putting a fish back in a fish tank. Um, it depends how long it's been out, if it's dried out already and, and so on. I'm going to therefore put that on hold and uh, uh, answer you afterwards. Because th there's, there's a particular set of halachas around uh, returning fish to the, the fish tank on Shabbos. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a separate matter. In terms of, of uh, mukta, though, uh, suffering of an animal would be enough to circumvent the uh, prohibition. In fact, I'll add that in for the next time I give the shape. I'll talk about that scenario also. Um, just, uh, uh, as I said, non-domesticated animals, uh, again, would be mukta. Uh, grooming, um, as far, again, would depend on the issue of mukta, and also depends no, on, uh, on whether you're grooming, pulling out you uh, hair. Sometimes if you yeah. just pet so then that would be a, it, it, the yeah. hair can be shedded just by the, the act of... I, I spoke to a vet, not, not Ben, someone else, who told me that that normally is hair which is anyway detached, ah. as opposed to actually pulling out hair. Um, that's what they told me, in which case this wouldn't be a problem. And even if the odd hair does get pulled out, it would be an unintended side consequence, which isn't a definite uh -huh. result, and I have no interest in it, and therefore it would be okay. Um, the, the, where grooming can be a problem is if I begin taking out leaves or twigs that are tangled, matted in the animal's fur, or its hair, because then that really is mukta. Um, little twigs and leaves and so on are mukta, and that would be a problem. Um, without going into too many gory details, uh, animal droppings uh, are clearly mukta, a classic example of mukta. Um, however... Uh, unpleasant mukta, which causes disgust and uh, hor is horrible to have around, uh, there's a leniency associated with that. It's the leniency of gruff shalay, it's known in Achik terms, the, a potty or something like that. Uh, and therefore, um, if, the, uh, if the animals' uh, droppings and, and feces and so on are left around in an area which uh, a child could get dirty themselves with, or it's just unpleasant and it's in the house and it's horrible, one would be allowed to scoop it up and put it away, because that is an allowance in the uh, halachas of mukta. Um, so that's a brief summary of, of some of those things. Um, medical care, very briefly, um, it basically, isuri uh, drabonon, rabbinical prohibitions, are allowed, and normally that resolves, if an animal is ill, that means, and it's suffering. If the animal, uh, if you can delay the treatment until after Shabbos, obviously you don't do it on Shabbos, but if the animal, something happens to an animal on Shabbos, it breaks a limb, or, or whatever it may be, and it's suffering, um, one can do uh, rabbinical prohibitions, which normally is enough to sort out the, the, the issue. So giving the animal medicine is not a problem. Mukta would be allowed um, to move it if it's suffering. Um, even if it's an, an animal that's mukta, normally, like if, if you have a bird in a bird cage and it's in the sunlight, 
and it's overheating, then you would be allowed to move that because of the animal suffering. And uh, similarly, instructing a non-Jewish vet to do whatever is necessary for its care would be the rabbinical prohibition of Amir al akum instructing a non-Jew, which would be deferred for uh, Saab al Khaim. So that's, uh, um, that, 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 that would allow most of those you scenarios. Pay after Shabbat. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Why, isn't there, why isn't there a problem that you might come to, uh, to grind up some morning? Because that's an Issa Drabonon, you're right. So, so medical care is, is uh, potentially a, a rabbinical Issa because you might come to grind, and that's, that's pushed off for, for, uh, for, for animal care. Um, so that's, that's uh, yes, sorry, Lana. So if you're going to give a cat a tablet, yes. and they wouldn't take the tablet, and you've got to grind it up into food, you're trying to make it into smaller pieces, surely yes. you'd be allowed to do that because they need the tablet. Um, it depends. The way most tablets are manufactured, it would not be a problem. But in principle, were there to be the rice of grinding, let's say we found a scenario where you needed to grind the food, then that's a problem. Then you'd have to do that before Shabbos. Because you can't do the malacha of grinding. Teichen is potentially a deraisa. Now, it happens to be that in, in tablet cases, they are, they are compressed uh, um, starch or, or flour, or, and, and therefore it normally would not be a problem. I don't know of any tablet where that would be a problem. Um, th th this reference was to the, the, old, the way they used to make medication, which they ground down herbs and things like that. But you're correct, if it was a real case of grinding, um, that, that would be a malacha deraisa, potentially, Torah prohibition, and you can't do that for the animal. That would be a serious problem. So you'd have to prepare it beforehand. If you have an animal which is, um, uh, someone contacted me about an elderly, I think an elderly pet, I think it was an elderly dog or something, that had trouble chewing its own food, and, and they had to prepare the food before, uh, before Shabbos. So, yeah, as far, I, don't, I don't remember the exact scenario, but that, that was the case. If you have um, an animal which is ill, yes. you need to get it to the vet. Needs taken to the vet, yes. Now, what can you do? Because obviously you can't drive. Yeah, well, you'd have to uh, either make an arrangement for a non-Jew to do it, or carry it. Push it in a buggy through the uh, uh, through 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 the streets um, or carry it or so on. Yeah, um, in an area outside an area of, uh, then again it'd be more serious. Issue. You'd have to get an Andrew to do it, and so on depends on the exact setup. So each each case would have to be uh, looked at in its own case. Um, the, the the allowance to break to breach a uh, derisa is an allowance made for human life, not for not for animals. <coughs> um, that, that an animal life is not significant enough to do that. At the end of the day, an animal is an animal, uh, and therefore it would be enough to push off a drabon or not a derisa. Um, I want to speak about a few more in the time available. I'd still like to get through a few more halachas. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just try and cover a, a few more Shabbat scenarios and then go on to other matters. Um, Seda, hunting, or trapping rather more accurately. Now, one of the halachas on Shabbos is, and this is not a halacha that's well known because we, we don't live in a, we're not hunters and trappers anymore. Um, so this is not a halacha that's well known, but it, one, one of the malachas, one of the 39 uh, primary of malachas is that of tzedah, of hunting or trapping. Now, um, why is trapping a malacha? Because it's, it's part of our mastery over creation, and it's a step in, in the production of things that we get from animals. So you trap a deer, and then you skin it and kill it, that's a malacha. Skin it, that's a malacha. Um, uh, make the leather through tanning, that's a malacha. And so on and so forth. These are, these are malachas. These are, these are classic creative acts which are forbidden as far as Torah law is concerned on Shabbos. Now this does have ramification for uh, pet keeping and this is something that, that is not always well understood and, and need, we need to spend a little bit of time explaining it. Um, th there's a few things that need to be said. There's um, what level of trapping one's engaging in and what the nature of the animal that one's trapping, um, what the nature <coughs> of the animal that one, one is trapping uh, is. And there's potential derisos here and potential drabonons here. So let me give you give some examples. If you have an animal which was roaming completely free, and I now uh, trap it so that I have it in my grasp, so I've done the full extent of trapping, condition number one. Condition number two, it's an animal that's completely wild. And condition number three, it's an animal that is, is a, the sort of animal that is trapped, something that, that people engage in trapping because they want to have this sort of animal like a, uh, a rabbit or, or you know, something that is trapped. If those three conditions are fulfilled, then, then I have here a potential Torah prohibition. If I'm lacking some of those conditions, um, then it could be a drabonon or it could be completely okay. So let's go to the opposite extreme. So we've spoken about one extreme, which is trapping an animal which is completely wild. It's usual to trap such an animal. It's the sort of animal <coughs> that gets hunted. And uh, I'm trapping it literally in a confined space. That is a, a derisor. 
Opposite extreme is an animal that's completely domesticated. I whistle and, and the dog comes running and uh, uh, it's completely at home with me. Um, that such an animal is already in my control. I'm not doing anything by trapping it. So there's no prohibition there of trapping the animal. Um, similarly, if it's a very slow animal, if I have a pet tortoise, again, there's in no way am I trapping it. It's, 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 it's accessible to, to us instantly, and that's not an act of trapping. Similarly, if the animal is already confined in its cage, then again, trapping would be irrelevant over here. So um, let's just go through some, some scenarios. Uh, a rabbit in its hutch is not a problem. It's already mm. trapped. If I open the hutch door and I let it run around in the garden, um, and then I have to go run around chasing after the rabbit to get it back. That, that is an act of, of uh, trapping the rabbit and uh, um, w would be uh, problematic. Having said that, since it was in the garden and relatively confined, it, it would be Drabonon, presumably, rather than Minhatora. Um, a well-trained dog, not a problem with trapping, because it comes running. A puppy that isn't yet well-trained, um, potentially a, a problem. Um, we have a middle level, which are animals which aren't fully trained, but they come back to me eventually. They come back at night for sanctuary and so on. Um, a, a poorly trained dog is in that category, um, it, unless it's literally no, no, ha no, no training has happened. And one, you know, once it's become used to me and this is its home, it sees its home as here, and therefore I'm no longer in the realm of Torah trapping. But rabbinically, if it's not yet properly trained and I do need to chase after it, uh, that could be a problem. Um, and then you have little rodent pets and gerbils and these sorts of things, which actually, if they get out of the, of the, the cage, you have a very serious problem. They, uh, they run around and actually quite hard uh, to trap. Um, several years ago, we got uh, a new gerbil, and um, my wife went out uh, for the evening with uh, my daughters, and I stayed at home with my sons, and we decided to take the gerbil out. And um, we were going to have some quality father-son time. <laughs> Um, we took the gerbil out. Within a minute, it, it slipped out of our uh, grasp. And we spent the next two hours um, chasing around this horrible beast all around the house, um, rowing with each other about who was responsible for having uh, let go of this gerbil, um, eventually cornering it in the corner of a room and building a system of barricades. Um, at, at the point the barricades was completed, then noticing that its head was peeking out behind uh, the bookcases and the other ends of the room, um, we ended up, it got into the sofa, and we ended up having to cut the base of the sofa to get it up. And, and my wife came home to find three very irritable uh, males. And <laughs> it was absolutely awful. Um, so gerbils are, are a real case of Seder, right? They're, they're not domesticated. They, uh, they don't really have a relationship, particularly with their owners. Um, and, and there you have a, a classical Seder. So again, the, the halachas are complicated. Um, the bottom line is as follows. Um, if your pet is completely trained, no problem at all. Um, if your pet is untrained, uh, you do have a potential problem. Um, if you need to open the cage door, for example, to feed it, you can do so as long as you're blocking the cage door. Uh, put the food in, close the cage door. At no point have I trapped the animal because it remains trapped the whole time, and that's absolutely okay. If I take it out of the cage and I'm holding it, again, at no point is it untrapped, and therefore, again, it's okay. If it escapes and begins running around the, uh, the garden, um, or it's a puppy that escapes out of the house, um, I now have to weigh up. If it's a derisa prohibition, I'm in a bit of a mess. If it's a Durabonum prohibition, I would be allowed to catch it in this case, because clearly letting it run around, in, in, if it's a little creature, letting it run around outside, or if it's a dog, it, in the, even in the garden, if it's a dog maybe in the garden, it would be fine, but letting it run around in the street would pose a threat to its life and uh, considerable pain and trauma for that animal, and therefore I'd be allowed to trap it if it's partially trained or if it's not a species that's normally trapped. Gerbils aren't species that are normally hunted, and therefore we're only in the Rabonon realm. So I'm aware that I've set here a number of conditions, and this is a little complicated. Um, to, again, just to, to make this as simple as possible, animal fully domesticated, not a problem. Animal that isn't domesticated, <coughs> best practices, keep it in the cage of a Shabbos, and if all have it in your hands, don't let it roam about. Um, if it does roam about, in most situations, you can only rehouse it if it's a danger to itself or to others. Um, so this is a halacha that one does need to be uh, a little bit cognizant of. Yes, Say something like a hamster. Yes. you move it from the cage, kept in your hands. Yes. And then rather than putting it back in the cage, yes. put it in one of those kind of little hamster balls. Yes. So at all points in time, it, it's trapped. Then there's no problem. Maintaining it being trapped is not a problem. The problem is taking a free animal and, and imprisoning it, trapping it. That's the problem. If at every stage it's contained, then that again wouldn't be, uh, th there'd be no problem over there. Um, yes. Why is walking an animal okay? Because 
Well, let's, so let's go through the case. If it's a domesticated dog, a trained dog, no problem at all, because it, it comes with running, and therefore uh, having it on the leash in no way is trapping it. Um, if it uh, is a non-domesticated, non-trained dog, then you can have it around in your house, because the size of the dog is such that inside the house it's, uh, it's trapped, and then you put it on the leash and you take it for the walk. Mm -hmm. If it's a non-trained dog and you take it out and it's running around in the, in the, in the parkland, and then you chase after it and catch it, then you are in at least Issa Drabonon territory. Mm. So, so you're, you're correct, it depends on each, uh, each, uh, each it scenario. Depends if there's an error, if you can walk in a certain um, that, We'll come to that in a minute, which is, besides the issue of trapping and mukta, there's another potential issue which is carrying on Shabbos, and, and we'll come to that also. Again, in the Eruv area, not a problem, but outside in Eruv, uh, if one goes away on holiday, I'll, I'll speak about that for a couple of minutes. Yeah. Just something about Phil, like a cat or dog roams around the house, like yeah. closing doors or windows within the house. Yes. So you're sort of traffic confined yeah. to a room. Yeah. Is um, normally speaking, for a, uh, an animal like that inside the house, it would be considered trapped. Maybe in the garden, not, but inside the house, you can get hold of it very easily. Um, if you have a bird in the house, that would be a, a different story. Because uh, a bird may be by shutting it into the room and so on, you are trapping it. So you'll have to look in each case. Am I genuinely, am I changing its state of confinement or not? So that's the question you need to ask yourself. Yeah. So when, so when you open and close the front door, yes. would you say that's not changing the state of, state of confinement for a either domesticated or poorly trained dog? Normally not, that is correct, yeah. Even though the Gemara uses the example of closing a front door, the, the, it's, re, it's really based on the Gemara. The Gemara says the following story, a, a deer comes running into someone's house. The front door is open and a deer came into the house and then they shut the door, the, the door of the house. Says the Gemara, that's an example of Seder, because I've, I've trapped the animal. But what you see in that is that, um, that the, the house is considered the size of trap for a deer. Why is that? Because uh, um, for, for that size creature, that's a way of trapping it. For a bird, maybe things will be different, and, and therefore each case needs to be looked at itself. <coughs> um, I just want to get through a few more halakhas, and we're running out of time, so uh, um, I, I will move on, and forgive me for that, I'm, I'm happy to, to speak today afterwards. Um, there is another prohibition, in Shabbos halakha, relevant to animals, which is we're not allowed to get our animals to do work for us on Shabbos. This is phrased on occasion in the Torah negative, in the negative form and on occasion in the positive form. In the positive form we say, Laman your nuach, shorch your ox and your, uh, your, your donkey should rest on Shabbos. Um, and we phrase it in the positive, in the negative form of Yom HaShri Shabbos HaShem Lekech, Lo Yisasa Kol Melacha, you shouldn't do work, who shouldn't do work? Atzor Vincho Vetech, Atzor HaMastor Vehem Techa, Vekech HaShem Shurecha. You shouldn't do work, nor should your servants, nor should your animal do work on Shabbos. Now, here it's important to understand the, the background to this. Anything that the animal does for itself is not a problem. So if the cow is wandering around the field, uh, tearing up grass from the, the field, it's doing what we would call a malacha on Shabbos. I'm not allowed to rip grass off the field. However, that's not the animal doing work. The animal doing malacha is doing malacha for me on Shabbos. So I can't burden my pack animal with carrying things for me. Um, however, the animal can do things necessary that, that it wishes to do in its own wandering around. Um, the basic rule is if it's for the benefit of the animal um, or a normal way that animals wander around in terms of guarding the animal is allowed. If it's for human benefit or abnormal in what animals do, then it wouldn't be allowed. So let's go through a few scenarios. An animal can wear a coat on Shabbos if it's cold. A dog can wear a dog coat on Shabbos if it's cold because it's there to look after the dog. Um, if I want my dog to be adorned with ribbons and other such things, well, the dog gets no benefit from me. It's my nonsense. Right? I like my dog uh, being decorated in that manner. I'm getting my dog to carry ribbons around for my benefit. A trivial example, but one that would involve this, this issue. Again, outside the area, if I'm getting the dog to carry things around merely for my benefit, and therefore it's doing a malacha for me. If I train my dog to, uh, um, when I whistle, to bring my newspaper in from, uh, from, the, uh, from, from the bottom of the garden path, then I'm getting my dog to, to do work for me. Okay, most of these scenarios aren't so uh, common nowadays, and therefore, generally speaking, uh, this halacha is not particularly relevant, um, and given that we live in an area with an area of it, it's even less so. What about walking with an animal with a leash? So there, halachically, we view the dog as carrying the leash. The dog is moving the leash along, and therefore, even outside an Erev, in principle, it's not a problem. And the leash is there in order to guard the dog, to protect the dog, and therefore, there's no problem with walking along with the leash. However, there are two provisos. And these two provisos are rabbinic in order that it shouldn't look like... At the end of the day, it's, it's an interesting thing, because intuitively, I'm holding the leash in my hand, and it looks like I'm carrying something. But in truth, 
it's true I'm holding the leash, but the, 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 the leash is, it belongs to the dog. It's the dog that's, that's, that's uh, is, is moving the leash along. So there's two provisors that Ghazal created because of that. The first thing is they said there shouldn't be too much of the leash dangling beyond my hand. Because the, the part of the leash beyond my hand that isn't between my hand and my, the dog isn't clearly connected to the dog. That I'm sort of carrying. It's not clearly directed to the dog. And they said restrict that to a tefach, a fist size <coughs> length beyond the amount that I'm carrying, uh, uh, beyond the amount beyond my hand. And secondly, they said hold the, the, the leash fairly taut so it doesn't dangle down within a, um, a small amount of the ground. So again, it's clear that it's, the, it's taut, that it's the animal that's holding the leash rather than it dangling down into the ground. So those are two provisos in terms of walking with an, a dog with a leash, but beyond that one can uh, um, go on holiday with even outside an Erev and, and have the animal on a leash and it isn't a concern. Um, bottom line is if you're going away on holiday in an Erev, that Erev, that's that often, and, and again, a shadow can be asked if one wants to just remind oneself of that. Sorry? I, I'm not going into that now, it's beyond, beyond the scope of the It's a lot beyond the... Beyond, that's correct, yeah. The, the Mishra yeah. says, but do you have a two tefachim, which is, uh, yeah, six, uh, yeah, and, and the Chilu says one tefach. It's, it's short, yeah. So it's, it's, it's different to the way you would normally in actually carry it. Um, huh. I'm, I'm, because we've run out of time, um, I'm going to say two things very briefly. Three, uh, two things very briefly. I mentioned two more halachas. Uh, three more halachas very briefly. Halacha number one is, um, there is a prohibition in the Torah, it's a pasuk in the Torah, um, telling us not to castrate uh, animals. Now, the parameters of this prohibition are, are complicated. Is it only male animals, which where the term castration is classically used for, or even the removal of ovaries for female animals? Um, is every method the same? Uh, um, uh, surgical castration or, or chemical castration? What about sterilization that doesn't have any physiological effect on the animal and really sterilizes it? What happens if I'm not doing it but I'm getting the vet to do it? Um, these are complicated halachas and therefore all I'm going to say is in any situation in which one, and, and it's not uncommon for an animal to need to be neutered or, or spayed, um, in any such situation ask a shiloh beforehand and, and it can be worked out if, it, if it's a genuine need. Um, and that's all I'll say on the topic because of the time limits, which is just be aware there is such halacha and it should be asked. Um, two more halachas that, again, I'll just mention very briefly. Um, one more halacha and then I'll stop. Uh, one more thing just to be aware of in terms of animal care, which is um, there's a halacha that one cannot daven in front of, in a space which is unclean and contaminated. So you wouldn't daven uh, in front of an open toilet door, you wouldn't daven in front of, uh, in, a, in a very dirty place. Um, and this is something to be cognizant of with animal droppings. Um, not all animal droppings are halachically problematic. Um, only animal droppings which are considered to have a particularly unpleasant odour or smell. It's interesting, the Gomorrah assumes that uh, dog droppings are not a problem. So that gives us a quantity, uh, if you like, of, of level of problem. Um, it, it, it only uh, more significant un unpleasant smells are problematic in this context. Again, it's just something to be cognizant of. When one has an animal around the house, one has a, a potentially dirty and unclean creature around, and therefore one just needs to think about uh, the halachas of tefillah, which uh, deserve <coughs> covered of tefillah and therefore one shouldn't uh, dive in front of them, potentially. I'll stop there. I hope that's given one a little taste, everyone a little taste of uh, animal halachas, and I wish you all uh, a good evening, and thank you for joining. Yeah.